Okay, I've got homework three here. I'm gonna send that around, and I see homework two is coalescing up here at the front. Okay, um, just to kind of give you an overview of what we're going to be doing the next two weeks, we've got the midterm coming up. The midterm is February 7th, that's a week from Thursday. Okay, so how the rest of the class schedule will work relative to that is you're getting your last pre-midterm homework today. Um, you can actually do a fair amount of the homework right now, and um, I'll, if somebody will remind me at the end of class, I'll let you know whether you can do all of homework three or just part of homework three by the end of class today. On Thursday, I will be giving you a study sheet for the midterm. Okay, so that's this Thursday that will have some terms to review, some suggested problems in Dixit and Skeeth, and um, some other problems for you to practice. So that's this Thursday. The midterm will cover the topics that we cover up to the end of class on Thursday. Okay? So if I start new topics a week from today, those won't be on the midterm. Um, it's quite possible that what's on the board right now will be what's covered on the midterm. That's my best guess. Um, if it's less, if we go slower, on Thursday, I won't put questions on the midterm that refer to material that we learn next week. That seems a little long, a little fast. Okay. Uh, anything else? On the homework, you'll hand in your homework next Tuesday to your TAs. You will not get your marked homeworks back before the midterm, but we will, in contrast to past weeks, we will hand out the solutions for homework three in class on Tuesday, okay? So even though you won't get your um, marked homeworks back, you will have your answer keys to look at. So next week, if you haven't already been saving a copy of your homework to study from, I'd recommend doing that, okay? The, the copy that you turn into the TAs is not gonna be available to you to prepare for the midterm. It's a good idea to make a copy so that you have one. 
So uh, any questions on that stuff? Good, good. All right, so um, we're going to start in today with a completely new game. Um, new game, but a little bit more on an old topic of Pareto efficiency. And um, the first version we're going to do of this game is actually quite simple. It's simpler than the fundraising game. This is a foreign aid game. Okay. This is a game between the government of a rich country. I'm going to sort of emphasize that it's sort of a game between two countries, but uh, for the point I'm making, I want you to think about the game being between the governments of the countries, not the people of the countries. Okay, and the rich government has a choice of sending aid or no aid, foreign aid, to the poor country. If it sends no aid, there's no strategic interaction. Okay, that's what I mean. This is a very simple game. If the rich government doesn't send aid, nothing happens. They continue along with their baseline payoffs here. If the rich government does send aid, now the poor government. Okay, and again, it's the government of the poor country has a choice about what to do with this aid money, okay? The poor government in this scenario can spend that aid money on education for its people or on limousines for its government officials, okay? The payoffs that go with this, the rich government likes the idea of education in the, um, in the poor country. It thinks that's uh, going to bring that country out of poverty, improve living conditions there. It's kind of what it has in mind by sending aid. Okay? So the rich government's payoff from sending aid if the poor government spends it on education is higher than the payoff from not sending aid. Okay? So here's a very clear illustration of something that I said at the beginning, that the payoffs in a game don't have to reflect self-interest. Okay? In this case, I'm saying the rich government really does want to help the people in this poor country, and it's being reflected in the, um, the higher payoff here. Okay? The poor government also thinks that education for its people is a good thing. Okay? Higher payoff here for both players. The other possibility, though, is that the poor government spends the aid money on limousines, and the rich government does not like that for a variety of reasons. You could think about the rich government um, just being out the money. It doesn't like that and placing no value on limousines. I think it's more likely that a uh, rich government that sent foreign aid to a country whose government used it for uh, what seemed to be pretty corrupt purposes would pay a penalty there. Okay? So bad payoff to the rich government if the aid gets spent on limousines. The poor government, however, like limousines a lot. They think they look real good driving around in those Mercedeses. They get a high payoff from that. Okay. This is an easy game, right? What's the choice at the poor government's note? Limousines. Okay. Very clear here. Strategic equivalent thus is negative two, five. I'm the rich government. What do I do? No aid. All right. Rollback equilibrium here is the rich government. Equilibrium strategy is no aid. The poor government strategy is limousines if aid. Okay. But in equilibrium, the poor government's never going to get to make this choice. Okay. The rich government's not even going to send the aid because you can't trust the poor government. Is the outcome in this game, the equilibrium outcome, Pareto efficient? No, it's not. Okay? It's an even starker case of Pareto inefficiency than we saw in last week's game. Just to repeat, in order to say that it's Pareto inefficient, all we have to do is find some other outcome in the game, regardless of whether we think it's the outcome that's going to happen. 
we think this one's going to happen, but if there's any other outcome in the game where one player is better off and no other player is worse off, that's enough for us to conclude that this outcome is Pareto inefficient. Now, in this case, it's real easy. It's not just that one player is better off. Both players are better off in this other outcome that doesn't occur. Okay. This outcome, Pareto dominates the equilibrium outcome. Okay. It doesn't, in order for us to say that something's Pareto dominated or Pareto inefficient, it doesn't have to be better for both players, but if it is better for both players, then we certainly know that the one that's worse for both players is Pareto inefficient. So this scenario here is, I think, a very stark example of something that sort of showed up in the fundraising game. The poor government would actually be better here, would be better off here if it didn't have a choice. Okay, and this is an important issue that we see in strategic situations. In non-strategic situations, in market situations especially, we think having more choices is good. It's always better to have more choices. Not necessarily when we're interacting strategically. The poor government, if the poor government didn't have the option of squandering the aid, the poor government could get to a higher um, payoff. So if the poor government could do something to commit itself to not buying those limousines, it could actually get a better payoff for itself. So I want to say a couple more things about Pareto efficiency and then one more thing about this game. Okay. One thing about Pareto efficiency is as, just as a criterion. Okay, so I'm moving away from the bad statement here of saying that this outcome is Pareto inefficient to just talking about the general concept of Pareto efficiency, of evaluating a situation in terms of the Pareto criterion, in terms of this idea of can we make at least one person better off without making anyone worse off. One of the main punchlines of Thursday's lecture last week was that that, that is a minimally good criterion, okay? If you can make a person better off without making anybody else worse off, you should do it. If you don't do it, that's bad in a very minimal way, okay? So saying that something is Pareto inefficient is identifying what's usually a pretty uncontroversial problem about it, okay? Another way to look at that, that point is that if something is Pareto efficient, it means there's some other alternative, some specific alternative that nobody would object if we could move to it. Okay, if we could somehow move from 0, 0 to 2, 2, nobody in this game would oppose it. Okay, so making a Pareto improvement should be uncontroversial. The flip side of that, though, is that saying that something is Pareto efficient, saying that an outcome is Pareto efficient, isn't saying very much in its favor, okay? Saying that an outcome is Pareto inefficient, unambiguously bad. Saying that something is Pareto efficient, well, we've ruled out one way that it can be unambiguously bad, but there's lots of other ways that an outcome can be bad that Pareto efficiency won't pick up, okay? So if we have a situation where the society is this whole room Okay, and I'm really rich, I've got the limousines and the houses and everything else, and you guys are all on the brink of starvation. Taking away one room of my house and giving it to one of you guys would be a Pareto, would, would not be a Pareto improvement. Okay, it would make me worse off. Okay, the situation where I have almost everything and you guys have basically nothing is Pareto efficient. Okay? It's not a good outcome. It's not something that most people would think is fair. Okay? So the limit of Pareto inefficiency is it's not going to help us make distinctions about fairness. And a couple of people came up after class on Thursday and sort of pointed that out in the 
fundraiser, um, in the fundraising game, that the, um, even the Pareto improvement about the outcome in that game was one that made the player that was already better off better. Okay? And that that seems sort of unfair about it. Now, that is a reasonable limitation of the Pareto criterion. Okay? If you'll remember from the fundraising game, the Pareto improvement there was that for our predicted outcome, which is that the incumbent raises funds, the challenger doesn't, and the incumbent wins, the Pareto improvement was that the incumbent wouldn't have to raise funds either. Okay? That the incumbent would still win the election, the challenger would still not raise funds, the challenger would be no worse off, but the incumbent would save the trouble of fundraising. Now what you might think about that is, yes, the situation where the incumbent does have to raise funds seems Pareto inefficient, but that's not a Pareto inefficiency that I give a real high priority to. Okay? Because the person who benefits by correcting it is the person who's already pretty well off. Notice, though, to make that kind of value statement, I do have to get to the point where I'm comparing the utility of one person to another. Okay? And I'm making kind of a big deal of this now because over the last two weeks, I was emphasizing that care needs to be taken when we compare payoffs about play across players. Okay, that in particular, it's one thing to say that the rich government's payoffs are zero, two, and negative two, and that that's reflecting some kind of reasonable assumption about what we could know about a rich government. Saying that the poor government's preferences are measured on a scale that we can compare to is a much, much bigger assumption. Okay? The point I've emphasized up to this point is we don't ever need, in game theory, in solving games, we never need to compare one person's payoff to another person's payoff. Okay? That said, sometimes when we're outside of game theory, when we're thinking about what's going on in the world and do we think it's fair, do we think it's just, do we think it's a good outcome, in those cases we may actually be comparing the utility, the well-being of one person to the well-being of another. Okay? If we say that we never do that any time in our life, we're basically ruling out our ability to make any kind of judgment about fairness. And I don't want you guys to think that, uh, that I think you should believe that or even that I believe it. I don't. I think that judgments about fairness are completely in order. They just require more care and I, I would say more honesty about assumptions more than what we need to solve games. Okay. All right. So whenever we say something's Pareto inefficient, we've identified a problem. Maybe it's a big problem, maybe it's a little problem, but it's usually an uncontroversial problem. Saying that something is Pareto efficient is not saying it's a fine situation. Okay? It's just saying there's one particular type of problem that doesn't exist. Okay, one particular type of uncontroversial problem that doesn't exist. All right. Given its limitations, though, it's still going to be a focus for us because there are so many strategic situations where the outcomes are Pareto inefficient. And when you see those kind of outcomes in real life, um, if it's a situation you care about, the Pareto inefficiency is probably going to bother you. It bothers people when it seems like there is an uncontroversial solution to a problem and it doesn't get implemented. Okay? That's what it means to stay in a Pareto inefficient state. Game theory is very good at helping us think about ways out of these Pareto inefficient states because we can ask ourselves, well, how could we change the game tree? How could we change the structure of interaction in a way that would get us to a Pareto efficient outcome? Okay. How could we do it in that particular scenario? I'm just thinking concretely with um, rich governments and poor governments.
No takers on that. Let me show you a different version of this game then and see if that uh, uh, brings up any ideas. I'm going to leave this version of the game here. And right next to it, I'm going to put really a more general version of the same game. Okay. This kind of game, I'm calling it the foreign aid game. Let me use my glue here. It's a special case of what is sometimes called the honor trust game. Okay. And it's related to the prisoner's dilemma, game theory's all-time greatest hit. Some of you guys have probably encountered it in other classes, a uh, game that we're going to talk about mostly after the midterm. Okay. So the honor trust version of this, we just have player one's choice is to trust player two or not. If player one doesn't trust player two, they steer clear of each other, there's no interaction, they go their merry ways with the payoffs of zero and zero. If player one does trust player two, then player two has the general version of these two choices. Player two can honor the trust. Both players get a higher outcome here. If player two honors the trust, keeps the agreement, or player two can betray player one, in which case we'd get payoffs like that. Honor trust games are a huge feature in lots of employment situations. Okay? Player one could be an employer who wants to hire somebody to help him with a job. It could be a contractor hiring a helper. It could be a professor hiring a research assistant. It could be a mom hiring a nanny. Whatever it is, that player one has to trust player two to do the job that she wants to do, that she wants done, okay? And in many cases, player two would be better off doing the job, getting paid for it, having that, re that employment relationship um, work the way player one wants it to. The problem is that player two is tempted to betray player one. The contractor's helper is tempted to not do a very good job. The research assistant is tempted not to double check the figures. The nanny is tempted not to take good care of the kids. All of these things would involve betraying the trust. It would make the first player sorry that she trusted the second one. And the problem, the problem arises when the second player gets a high payoff from it. Kiara. That's a good answer to the question that I posed at the beginning. Okay, so the question I had posed when we left this game and um, went to this one was what could the rich government and the poor government do to get out of this situation? And uh, you guys weren't quite ready to think about rich governments and poor governments, but I thought something a little closer to home uh, might, might get you thinking. And what Kiara says is in lots of these situations, the game doesn't end here. Okay, if player two betrays the trust of player one, rather than just getting payoffs right here, we could be in a game where player one has another move, which is punish or not. Okay, um, the mom can fire the nanny. And then the question is whether the punishment is worse than the, um, the fun of the betrayal. Uh, all those situations are one where the player could be fired, where negative references could be held out as a punishment, um, depending on uh, the particular context. Player one could beat up player two. Um, that's effective, but may lead to other bad uh, retaliation down there. So one way out of this kind of honor trust relationship is to have a possible punishment. Okay? I'm not going to go through the whole logic 
here. There are versions of this in Dixit and Skeeth, but one thing I think you can probably see even without me solving the game is that depending on the values of punishment, we could get to the good equilibrium here and the punishment would never have to occur, okay? The punishment, a good punishment will be off the equilibrium path. It will never have to be exercised. It's got that same irony that this game has in it. You might think that giving player one the opportunity to punish player two would be bad for player two, but actually not, okay? If player one has the opportunity to punish player two, then that could be enough to move us from this equilibrium path to one where we actually do see honor and trust. Okay. Any other thoughts on um, how to get out of the bad equilibrium here? Other changes? Yes. You're wanting me to sort of spin out this. What's your name? Kyra. Kyra. Kyra is saying, how does this exactly work? I've got this node floating around here. Let's, um, you know what? Let me think about that. I want to do an example that shows you what I want you to get out of it. And the example I sort of got going in my head has too many loose ends with it. So if I get real confident, I'll do an example by the end of class today. More likely, I'll do one on Thursday. I'll come up with one that works uh, and uh, check it twice before I uh, spring it on you guys. Okay, so um, a note there, a nice green marker to myself. Okay. Any other thoughts on what, what we could do? Stephanie? Stephanie is saying if somehow the poor government could put a condition on the aid. And there's, I would say there's sort of two flavors of that. One is kind of the flip side of Kiara's point about um, punishing betrayal. An alternative way to do that is rewarding good behavior. Okay? So you spend it on education and guess what? We give you more money. Okay? So and that's that's going to be something that will loom large throughout the class, that the idea of future rewards and punishments can, um, can get us out of these bad situations. Um, another flavor of Stephanie's point, another way that the rich government could just sort of uh, take away the ability to squander the aid would be not to give them money. Send books and teachers and things like that that are kind of like hard to turn in to limousines. And that would be a case. I mean, I guess it's possible. You could put them to work, um, you know, building cars, but it might not be quite the Mercedes you had in mind. If you just don't have a choice here, again, that it sort of seems obvious, but the interesting thing is I took away some of the choice of the poor government, and I got the poor government itself to a better outcome. Okay. Um, that can happen in the employment scenarios, too. Uh, an employer who's worrying about an employee betraying her might try to um, take away the opportunity for the employee to do the betraying. Um, if you're worried about the nanny talking on the phone to her friends all the time, um, well, in this day of cell phones, you can't really uh, take away the phone. Um, doing something like monitoring the, um, the second player, the person who's tr to whom trust is extended. One other way um, that I can think of that players in the real world 
try to get out of this game. And this, I was going to say this requires mostly work on the part of the first player, but not necessarily. Employers and rich governments can try to select who to send aid to, who to hire. Okay? Employers often try to screen their prospective employees. And prospective employees go to some work to show that they have a history of honoring trust, um, that they are people who don't want to betray trust to begin with. So an awful lot of the communication that goes on between people or governments or firms that find themselves in this kind of situation, a lot of the communication involves the player who could betray the other one trying to give solid evidence to the first player that they wouldn't want to do it, that I don't have a payoff of five here, that no, my payoff from betraying you, I have a conscience, my mom raised me right, my payoff would be really, really low here, um, so that therefore my choice, now I've added the negative five, I would feel so bad if I betrayed you, it would, be, it would hurt me more than it would hurt you. Okay, that would put us on this equilibrium path. Okay, so screening to find a player with um, preferences that promote honoring trust rather than betraying trust. Okay. So what I'm going to do now, I'm going to start talking about uncertainty in games. I've been sort of building up to this uh, over the last couple weeks. And I'm actually, my example with uncertainty is going to partly address Kyra's question. What you're going to see in this version of the game is not so much the rich government punishing the poor government, but um, something bad happening nonetheless that will work like a punishment. Okay. So what I'm going to do in this version of the game, I'm going to clean it up. See if this changes the equilibrium. Okay, so we've still got the basics. The rich government can choose not to send aid. We get our baseline payoffs there. The poor government can choose education or limousines. Okay. But now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to do something we haven't seen in the game yet, and I'm going to talk through the story behind it while I do it. Okay. <laughs> now, though, if the poor government chooses limousines, I'm going to leave this blank right now. I'm leaving this node blank, but I'm going to tell you what can happen. There might be a riot. Okay, so in this case, it's not punishment by the rich government. You could think of it as pub punishment by the population of this country that is really tired of seeing those guys riding around with their machine guns and their big cars Well, kids don't even have textbooks in their schools. They can riot or not. Okay. I'm not putting the population as a strategic player in the game. Okay. And there are reasons why um, we might not do that. The decision to Riot is something that may have some strategic elements to it. Um, and though I am a strategic behavior, I kind of think that when those riots get going, that there's some pretty non-rational, non-strategic sort of primal. People just get excited and uh, emotions take over there. Okay? So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to regard the riots as an act of nature. This is what we always do in game theory when we want to think about uncertainty. Okay? The way we're thinking about this here is I'm the poor government, and when I get to the point of solving this node, now I'm, gonna, I'm not just thinking about do I like education or do I like limousines. I'm thinking, do I like education, do I like limousines, and how do I feel if those guys are rioting in front of my palace? I don't like it, as a matter of fact. Okay. What's different about this nature node is whether or not there's a riot is not any player's strategic choice. 
It's just <laughs> random. Okay, it's an act of nature. It's not something that we can solve through backward induction. Okay, we just have to accept the fact that maybe it will happen and maybe it won't. Okay, so that is the key difference. Now we're going to represent uncertainty with these nature nodes that look a lot like decision nodes. Okay, it's a node in a tree. It's got branches coming out of it, leading to, in this case, other terminal nodes It will also, in another game, that we're going to see lead to other decision nodes. So in one sense, it looks like a decision node. The differences, go, it's important enough that I'll write them over by the outline here. Yeah. Differences between nature nodes and decision nodes is nature nodes are random, not solved by some players optimal choice. Okay? That's, I would say, the most fundamental difference. It actually won't matter until we're solving the game. In setting up the game, the difference between nature nodes and decision nodes is that nature nodes have probabilities. on the branches. Okay. So, so far, this nature node looks just like a decision node. It's like, okay, well, so nature can choose a riot or not. If nature was a player, I'd have to put payoffs for nature, and nature would be making a strategic choice. You have to be really superstitious to think that nature is a player that's you know, out to get you or out to help you or something like that. We, we avoid that here. We think that nature is just in this case, we'll say nature's flipping a coin. We'll say, do we, how likely do we think a riot is? Just as likely to have one as, there, as we are not to have one. Okay? Often when we're really uncertain, that's what we mean, that one alternative is just as likely as the other. And I'm going back to black here to really underscore that the probabilities attached to a nature node are part of setting up the game. Okay? So the probability here, I'm writing it out, equals 0.5. And the probability of not having a riot also has to equal 0.5. Okay. So when you're setting up a game and some part of the outcome is uncertain, okay? So from the poor government's point of view, actually from the rich government's point of view, too, if I choose those limousines, I don't know if there's going to be a riot or not. I care if there's going to be a riot. I can't strategically anticipate whether there's going to be a riot or not. I just have to accept the fact that I think a riot is just as likely as it isn't. Okay, so and I accept that fact by putting these probabilities in here. Okay. So if I'm the poor government, I choose limousines, and there's not a riot, the outcome is just like it was in the game before. Okay? That's what we were assuming in the game before. We weren't even worrying about um, riots. So the rich government's payoff is negative 2, and the poor government's payoff is 5. Okay? It's a good, good payoff there. No riots, got my nice car, fine, very good. I'm the poor government, rich government. Oh, those guys, we gave them money, they squandered it. So embarrassing, minus two. All right. If there is a riot, though, I'm going to assume here that the rich government isn't affected. Okay? The rich government is really annoyed about their aid money being spent on limousines. The riot or not, they, it's all washing out to them. Okay? So their payoff is the same here. The poor government, though, is a little bit scared by this riot, okay? Things are getting bad out there. They're burning things. My payoff is negative, too, here, okay? 
Okay. So a low payoff. All right. So this, as I said, is pretty close to um, Kyra's question about adding something that would punish a poor government. What's new about it, what's a different twist, but what is actually going to be enough here is the punishment isn't certain. Okay? Um, nature in the form of rioting people could pu punish the poor government for the limousines, but it's not going to happen for sure. Okay? So what are we going to do? Now I'm switching to blue. And again, let me draw your attention here to how this game does and does not look like the games that we've solved so far. It does look like the games that have not had uncertainty because all the events are represented by nodes and the things that can happen at the nodes are represented by branches. And we've got the branches labeled so we sort of know what they correspond to. At the bottom, we have payoffs. That looks mostly like what we've done so far. But one thing that is different is that now we have three different labels in our nodes, but only two payoffs. Okay, and again, I want to emphasize here that when you add nature as quote unquote a player, nature doesn't get a payoff. Okay? Nature's not happy about the riots or unhappy about the riots. Nature's not solving things backward. Nature's not strategizing. Okay? Nature's just going to, in this case, flip the coin okay, about rioting or not. Okay? So what's missing from the game here is payoffs that correspond to the decision maker at some node, even though decision maker I'm putting in scare quotes here because it's really not a decision, it's just an event that occurs. The other thing that's different that takes the place in our analysis of a payoff for nature are these probabilities. Okay. So we're going to use those probabilities now to solve the game the same way we've solved games without uncertainty. We're going to solve it from the bottom up. We're going to start with the very lowest node and we're going to roll it back. Okay? But starting with this node, what are we going to do? We don't have payoffs for nature. We can't figure out how nature would make the choice if nature was strategic. What we do instead is the way we handle uncertainty in many, many other situations we figure out what the expected value of the outcomes are. Okay? So this is important enough that I'm going to kind of add it to my list. Differences between nature nodes and decision nodes. Nature nodes are not solved by optimal choice. They have probabilities on the branches. And last, certainly not least, probably most important of all, we solve a nature node by replacing it with, I'm saying expected values, but expected value of what? Expected value of the payoffs. Okay. I'll write it out like that. Expected value, E-A-L-U-E, -E, of payoffs. What we'll say for shorthand a lot of the time is just the expected payoffs. Okay. So what I'm going to do is instead of putting the strategic equivalent here, you can think about the probabilistic equivalent. What on average does the poor government expect to get from limousines? Okay. What is the poor government's expected payoff here? That's what we want to replace this node with rather than the strategic equivalent. Okay. So in terms of strategic thinking in general, the poor government is not superstitious. It doesn't think that it can outstrategize nature, but it knows that it can incorporate the information contained in the probabilities and the payoffs to come up with an expectation, an expected outcome for this node, an expected payoff for itself is the part of the outcome that it cares about. Okay. And 
Let's see. I think what I'm going to do is calculate the expected value in the context of the problem first and then give you the formula. Let me just ask right now. Um, so how many of you guys know how to find the expected payoff here? OK, that's pretty good. How many of you really have no clue what I'm talking about? OK, that's OK. There's the, both cells filled there. All right, so this is what I'm going to do. What I'm going to do is I'm going to say with probability 0.5, I, I'm the poor government now. I'm the limousine-loving poor government here. My payoff is going to be negative 2. And with probability 0.5, my payoff is going to be 5. I'm going to multiply each possibility by its probability and add them up. Okay? And this is my expected payoff. Okay. Expected payoff of the poor here. Okay. So just 0.5 is 1 half, so I'm going to get this whole thing over 1 half. Negative 2 plus 5. See what I'm doing here? Okay, just simplifying this. So it looks like 3 halves, huh? This is what I expect to get. 1 and a half. Okay. A good way to think concretely about expected values in any context, in statistics, in finance, um, any place that you encounter probabilities in gambling, is to think about if the poor government played this game over and over again, what would be the average winning? Okay? That m most people find it easier to think about expected values by running this thought experiment, just a second, uh, doing it over and over again. Yes? What's the last word? Of, of poor. The poor government. Okay? So the way I got this expression was, let me use a yeah, different color there. Okay. One probability here, the payoff associated with it. Okay. The other probability there, and the payoff associated with that. Okay? Yes? So will the probability No, it won't. The next step is going to be to think about other probabilities here. Now, 0.5 is a nice probability, and it's one where when you think you're kind of in the maximum amount of uncertainty, you ask yourself, what do I think is going to happen? Do I think one is more likely than the other? I just truly don't know. 0.5 is going to capture that level of uncertainty because it means both outcomes are equally likely. You can't say it's probably this, it's probably that. Okay? But we can use the same formula to think about cases where we think, oh yeah, riots much more likely. 90% here, 10% there. So you're always going to calculate the expected payoff for the player each We're going to do, um, Elaine is asking, so we're always going to uh, calculate the expected payoff for the poor, yes, we are going to do that, but we're going to do it for the rich, too. Okay? So what we're going to do is, before we would have had strategic equivalence bubbling up here, now we're going to have expected values that will then feed into the strategic equivalence here. So what we're going to do is we're going to do it for both players here. But I'm starting with the poor because that's the payoff that's going to govern the behavior at the next node. It's also true in this example, the rich player's uh, payoff actually doesn't depend on the uncertainty. Okay, they're going to get negative two either way. But if the rich player had different payoffs here, we would calculate her expected value. Okay. All right, so let me do a slightly more uh, abstract version of this. Okay. Let's see how much. Yeah, sorry, I'm going to have to go into 
a little bit of extra jargon here. I just don't see any way around it. And if you haven't seen it before, I guarantee you, you'll see, you'll see it again. Learning how to think systematically about uncertainty, learning how to use probability is one of the most important things that you guys should learn before you graduate college. Um, I think more of you are learning it now in high school. When I, when I went to high school, there was never any idea of teaching high school kids probability. And um, that's changed. That's a really good thing. Um, as big a fan as I am of you learning calculus, it's actually much more important to, um, to learn probability. Okay? Thinking about uncertainty just happens all the time. And it is a very hard thing to learn without a class. Okay? It's just slippery. It's back to the stuff I talked about on the first day of class. It's not something that our brains evolved to do very well. Okay? Our brains didn't evolve to process uncertainty in an unbiased way. And many of you guys have taken psychology classes, and you know that it's just kind of left to their own devices. People will be wildly wrong in the way they'll assess probabilities. Okay? So examples of that are that many more people are really afraid of flying than they are of driving on the 405. Okay? And the fact is you're in much more danger on the 405, statistically, of being in a fatal accident than you are of being in a plane wreck. I mean, plane wrecks just really don't happen very often. The odds are very, very low. Uh, 405, I mean, I'm on it twice a day, most days, but fact is people die there. Uh, it's, it's a much more dangerous thing. The point I'm getting to here is when we just are left to our natural way of thinking, we don't systematically think of probabilities. Okay? We don't think about them correctly. So the um, formula that I'm going to give you now for calculating expected value is going to look unnatural. You're going to have to spend some time thinking about it if you're new to it, but it's really, really worth it. Okay? It's an important way to, it's an important tool that you can use to complement your intuition. Okay, something that your intuition won't do well, but um, will help you put your intuitions to good use. All right. So all that wind up is if is uh, getting me to the formula for the expected value, any expected value of a random variable. Okay. This is what I'm hemming and hawing about. I don't like having all the jargon here. I know some of you don't like it. And the ones who don't like it the most are probably the ones that need to hear it the most. But a random variable is just anything that we're uncertain about. Okay. If something is a random variable, it's an unknown outcome with probabilities assigned to each possible event. Okay. So the random variable that we calculated the expected value of up here was the payoff of the poor. Okay, the payoff of the poor wasn't known, but I had a probability assigned to each outcome. Okay, so this is the sort of divide and conquer approach to uncertainty. We don't know what's going to happen. We make a list of the possible things that can happen, and then we assign probabilities to them. Okay, sometimes we have a good deal of precision in the probabilities that we assign. Other times, we're just picking approximate numbers that represent what we think is going on. That's, I would say, more the case in this 0.5 example. Okay. So right now, we're thinking about any old random variable. Okay. And so the random variable is going to be a list of possible outcomes and probabilities. Okay. So if random variable capital X, yeah, okay, it's big because it's a capital X, takes on values x1, x2, up to xn with 
probabilities, P1, P2, all the way up to Pn, then the expected value of x is this. Okay. This capital E, like this, is the expectation sign. Okay, it means take the expected value of random variable x, capital X, this thing I don't know the value of, and you do this by taking each possible value, each thing that could happen, I don't know which one it's going to be yet, and multiplying by its probability. Okay, so the expected value is x1 times p1 plus x2 times p2, x3 times p3, dot, 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 until they're all used up. Okay. Now, this is more than we needed for up here. Okay. Up here, we had a random variable that just took on two values. Okay. So what we did was do even one part here. It took on two values. One possibility was a negative two. We'll call that x1. Okay, one possibility. The probability that goes with that was 0.5. It's p1. The other possible thing that could happen with this random variable is x2. Okay. No riots, got my limousine, and the probability of that was P2. Okay? And we took those numbers and we put them into the formula. Okay? I actually switched the order of the multiplication here, but you guys remember that P1 times X1 is the same as X1 times P1. Okay? So this is P1, X1, plus P2, X2 equals the expected value of X, of this random variable. This formula is the one that many of you have seen in statistics classes, um, probability classes, any kind of social science that uses um, probability to help us understand what's going on, any social science that deals with uncertainty is going to calculate expected values, and we all do it the same way. Okay, so this isn't any kind of special political science way of doing it. It's not special to game theory. It's something that's out there used ubiquitously for dealing with uncertainty, um, and we're using it in game theory the same way. Okay. All right. So this is the general formula. Let me help you guys sort it out. I don't know if I could say that in all of our problems, we're just going to have two possibilities, but a lot of the time we just have two possibilities. Okay? So one special case of this is um, a random variable with two possible outcomes. Okay? A nature node with two branches. Okay? When it's a nature node with two branches, the expected value is just the probability that one thing happens times that thing, the probability we get a payoff of negative two times negative two plus the probability the other thing happens. That thing. Okay? So this is the formula that we have up there. And if you look at this formula, I think you could kind of see why it does what we need it to do. When we're making a choice under uncertainty, okay, when we're, we're the poor government and we're choosing whether we want those limousines or not, we need to be thinking about both how likely the riot is, okay, is the bad thing going to happen, is it really likely to happen or not so likely to happen, and how bad is it? Okay, so we need to be thinking about both how likely the different outcomes are and how good or bad they are. I think that when we make choices under uncertainty in the real world, we balance 
those two fa factors, right? If you're, um, if it's today and you're trying to decide whether you should take an umbrella or not, right? Two days ago they were saying it might rain tonight, now they're not saying it. What you're going to be thinking about is how likely is the rain? Is it 80% chance or 20% chance? But you're also going to be thinking about how much do you hate getting wet? Okay? Is it a day when you have to be outside a lot? Do you have hair that looks really bad when it rains? Um, are you carrying a lot of stuff? Um, do your shoes leak? All of those kinds of things are captured in the axis here. So you need to both be thinking about the values of the things that can happen to you and how likely they are. Yeah, Brandon. Yes, yes, yes. Um, Brandon's question is, do we need to do this for player one as well? Um, and he appropriately qualified it with, if this was something where it mattered for player one, okay? You can look at the game here and say, well, it's negative two either way for the rich government and correctly infer that um, the rich government's expected payoff is known here. If these weren't the same, we'd have to do the calculation. The even better news is if we're going through, we're solving away, we're kind of in a zone, and we just calculate the expected value here, even though we don't have to, we'll get the right answer. Okay, so I, actually I think I'm going to do that right now. So what I'm going to do is we've kind of had this little... Uh, digression, an important digression, on calculating expected values in general, I'm now going to erase, I think I'm going to erase all of the analysis I've done so far, and I'm just going to solve the game. Okay? Put those things all together. Just have to rewrite that part of the My choices at the nature node were riot, probability 0.5, not riot, 0.5. And um, the payoffs here were, I just erased them. They were what, negative 2, negative 2? Yeah. Is that right? Good. 2, negative 2. And over here it was negative 2, 5. Okay. So now we're going to solve it from the bottom up. We're going to solve it the way we've solved all games, except that we're going to replace the nature node with the expected payoffs for both players. Okay. So doing that, what I'm going to do is I'm going to calculate the expected payoff for player one. Again, I don't have to, but I'm just showing you that if I put these numbers and these probabilities into the formula, I'll get a sensible answer. You don't have to worry about about that. Okay, so if I have one half times negative two plus one half times negative two, that's my payoff, my expected payoff for the rich player. It's um, negative two plus negative two over two. Sounds like negative four over two. I get my negative two there. And I get one half times negative two, I'm now on the other side of the comma, I'm doing the expected payoff for the poor player here, plus one half times five here, so I get negative two plus five is three divided by two, it's three halves. Okay. So this is my expected payoff. So now I've rolled up this part of the tree. Okay, I've replaced it with the expected payoffs here. So now I'm the poor government. I'm looking forward. I'm reasoning backward. I'm saying, do I want education, which gives me a payoff of two, or do I want limousines, which gives me an expected payoff of three halves? The three halves balances the probability of a bad thing for me, limousine plus riots, and a good thing for me, limousine with no riots. Okay? So I compare the three halves to the two. I compare the expected payoffs. Okay? What's the poor government going to do? Education. 
right? The strategic equivalent now is 2-2. Two, two. What's the rich government going to do? Eight. Okay. So here's the case where this expected, let me not say expected value, where this possibility of punishment for player two changes the equilibrium. Okay. That's what we did with this. Now the rollback equilibrium is the rich government sends aid, the poor says education, if aid, what's changed is the possibility of punishment. So um, I think there is, I have five minutes and I think I have a five minute thing that I can do that will enable you to get a really good start on your, um, on your homework, okay? I've said a couple of times today that this thing of calculating expected values is done outside of game theory. It's a very general way to approach problems. Um, and one place where you'll see it uh, in a way that looks very similar to game theory is in what's called decision theory. Okay, so what's the difference between decision theory and game theory? Decision in this context means a game with just one player in it. One player and nature. Okay, and so you have an example of this as the very first thing on your um, homework, okay? Sometimes people will say that decisions are a game against nature. You're not trying to strategize another person, so they're simpler in that respect. But you are trying to deal with uncertainty and you're trying to deal with it systematically. One place that decision theory gets used a lot, and you may have actually encountered it, is in um, health care and treatment options. Um, my HMO, for example, has a website that you can go to and for some kind of common diagnoses, they can give you the probabilities of having a side effect from some treatment, the probability that it'll make you better, and they'll, they'll actually set up little trees to help you decide whether the treatment is a good choice for you or not. Um, in um, military planning, sometimes Military strategists are actually doing strategy. They're thinking about the other army, but a lot of um, military activity is just logistics, you know, getting things from one place to the other, not sure what's going to happen, um, how are we going to work together in the face of uncertainty, and decision theory is used there, too. Okay, so a decision is just a game with one player. Um, Elaine. Between player and nature? Between a player and you, you can sit, Elaine says it's a game between a player and nature. You can kind of think of it that way. Um, except that nature's not out to get you. You got to remember that, okay? And I'm gonna um, I'm gonna quickly do a game here um, that I think I'm, I'm gonna do today. I'm, it, it might help me illustrate something uh, to um, later as well. Okay, so this is this is a decision. Okay, one player plus nature, how to make a choice under uncertainty. So that scenario I just gave, do you bring your umbrella or not? You don't know whether it's going to rain, you have to pick the optimal choice. That would be one choice. Um, one that's more vivid, unfortunately vivid for me right now is the decision, a decision I made as a mom over the break. And the decision was, um, I'm visiting my family in Colorado and to and watching my son doing some very foolish things while he was sledding. Um, and my decision was to allow or forbid him to um, stand up on his little plastic sled and go over the bumps. Do I allow it or do I forbid it? If I allow it, nature has a move. 
okay, they're going to be a bad crash or not. Okay, there's no strategy here. Um, I'm making the decision by myself, and this is a situation where um, if I had yanked my son off of the slope, he probably, he, he would have obeyed me. He's a pretty good kid. Okay, so for bidding um, my son from sledding, let's call that the zero, zero. No, it's not a zero, zero outcome. Why did, what did I do wrong here? He doesn't get a payoff. He's just a passive observer, okay? Boy, was that true by the end of the story. Okay, so it's just my payoff here. Decisions have only a single payoff. Okay, um, if I allow him to do his goofy tricks and there's not a bad crash, we're all having a good time. I'm standing there talking to my brother and dad and we're watching the kids and they're enjoying the snow and all of that. Um, we, I got a high payoff out of that. If there's a bad crash, well, it's bad. It's, it's way bad, okay. The question is, what do I do here, okay? Do I allow the foolishness or do I forbid it, okay? What I'm going to do right now is I'm going to let the probability be a variable. Okay, you were asking about whether the probabilities are always 0.5. And in this case, I actually don't think that a bad crash was all that likely. Um, I didn't think that a bad crash was all that likely. Um, but let's just let it be a variable, P, and then the probability of not being a crash when there's just two things is 1 minus P. Okay. So question in the back. These are all the things that I'm, that I'm factoring in. You're wondering where the probability comes from. So the factors that would go into my estimate of P, you're thinking how good a sledder is my son, how icy is the snow, how big is the hill, what are the other kids doing, is he a klutz or not, all of those things. Okay. What I'm going I'm to let this be a cliffhanger now. Okay, but one thing you guys could do right now is you could solve this and you could tell me how likely a crash could be for me to still allow him to do the sledding. Okay, so that's the question I'm going to leave you with. How high can P be for allow to be the correct decision. Okay? So that's where we'll pick up on Tuesday.